Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Podcast, a podcast about getting out from behind the keyboard and just talking. Each week, we invite a guest or two to sit down and talk about their life and their work. I'm Christopher Brown, your host, and this is the Cross Border Interview Podcast featuring Canadian comedian Mary Walsh. Mary, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it, as I already said. But uh, I start off all my interviews with similar question. But to you, I'm going to pose this question. What is comedy to you? Hmm. What, what is comedy? You know, I saw, you know, I never liked David Letterman that much. Like he was just when he was really at the height of his powers, I felt he was appealing to guys who were in frats, you know, like those frat boys with the stupid pet tricks and the way he treated women on that show and everything about him. I never got on the David uh, Letterman train and uh, my son watched, um, uh, you know, Dave Chappelle uh, when, you know, when Jesse, when Jesse was growing up, the Dave Chappelle show was on, I must say, you know, he was outrageous and a lot of fun. So I saw David Letterman. Now the new David Letterman with the long white beard interviewed Dave Chappelle, Chappelle the other day. Now I've watched a couple of Netflix specials. And I have, I haven't found Dave Chappelle as funny as I found him on the sketch comedy. Cause you know, to me, <clears throat> There's stand-up comedy and there's sketch comedy. I'm a big sketch comedy proponent. You know, I just like it. And I think that that's what we're best at in this country. But um, anyway, so, uh, but David Letterman was so, oh, so uh, respectful and full of praise and stuff and so much unlike himself. And he was going, you know, I watched the body of your work and I have to say, you know, I have so much respect for you and so much, you know, and I thought, you know, Dave Chappelle and maybe David Letterman, too, now. Uh, but, you know, people like Dave Chappelle and Richard Pryor told the truth about things when it wasn't. And poor old Lenny Bruce, you know, they told the truth, the truth. And so that's what comedian that's what comedy is to me. Like um, I was talking to my therapist the other day and he said something and I saw something for the first time and I started to laugh after it. And he said, why? You know, what made you laugh? And I. I thought what made me laugh was recognition. There is the laugh of recognition when you recognize after all this time that you've been blinding yourself to the facts and there they are. And you just laugh. You think that's so true. That's right. And um, that's what comedy is, I think. And, you know, if you look back at, um, uh, you know, a modest proposal, you know, um, when he made that, people were outraged for a number of people stupidly thought he he meant that we that the English should be eating Irish babies and and fattening up the mothers. And but but it changed some things in the parliament. He was writing it against some laws that were in place that were very, uh, you know, anti-Irish as they continue to be all the time. I don't know why, but um, uh, but some of those laws got changed because of what Swift wrote. Yeah. And so sometimes it's like people go, oh, I can't. You know, people are so outraged that people are saying anything. Um, uh, and, and there is that whole Twitter uh, you know, thing that cancel culture and stuff like that. And uh, I think that, you know, another person I really greatly admire is, um, oh God, what's his name? Um, uh, you know, he did The Office. Oh, the um, Ricky Gervais. Ricky Gervais. And he said, no, no, no. You know, because people were saying you can't say anything as a comedian anymore. He said, you can say what you like as a comedian whether or not it will be acceptable or not, that's always been the case. You you know, your job is to say what you think. Like, I wanted to say something about an issue that is very, very, um, uh, I was going to do the Winnipeg Comedy Festival and then I didn't do it because of COVID uh, because I thought it made me feel like Newfoundland is a very safe place right now. We only have three active cases and we have had no community transmission in months. And I felt like I was one of those women in the horror shows with a long white nightdress on standing in a perfectly lit safe house at the basement door with a candle in my hand thinking, I'm just going to go down to the basement just to see what's going on down there. So I decided not to go. But before I went, I wanted to do this material and my a person who works with me, who's quite young and very, very good, uh, Jill, actually, uh, she went, 
no, you know, you, she really got very, very upset. And she said, you can't say that. You really can't say any of those things. I said, I'm, I'm just going to be talking about my own experience, you know, with this. And she said, no, you know, because there had been some uh, ugly uh, stuff about some things. Actually, I just posted something that was in the fucking newspaper, but there'd been an ugly reaction. And, um, and I listened to her. And then about two weeks later, I thought, but that is what is on my mind. And that is the truth as I know it, not that it's some profound truth. So what else is, what else am I going to be doing? Like trying to find something that's going to offend, no, make sure that it offends no one and that it touches no one and that no one cares about it one way or the other. Like I, so that's a very long answer, but that's what I think that comedy is. It's a necessary part of life and comedians are the people who tell the truth. Sometimes they tell the truth in an under, you know, in a sneaky way that you don't know that they're saying that. And they, you know, and sometimes they just come right out and, and blast out the truth. Right. Well, I, I think you touched on about 12 subjects I want to dive into now because I didn't expect that long of an answer, but I'm glad you gave that long of an answer because if you didn't, it would be a I really always bad did better on podcast. the essay questions because I could just bullshit my way through essay questions, whereas the <laughs> right or wrong, I was terrible on that. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so about canceled culture, uh, as a comedian, you, you just talked about it briefly there that comedians today are now finding themselves, they have to edit themselves and be a different comedian than they were potentially. But do you think Lenny Bruce didn't have to edit himself? I mean, he didn't. And he ended up going to jail. Right. Do you think that uh, do you think that any of the great comedians that we have admired down through the, you know, because they're part of a larger culture and they're saying things that people, you know, we were denounced our company, Codco, from the from the steps of the um, of the Basilica, which is the Roman Catholic Basilica in by Father Hickey, who died in prison, by the way, yeah. who said that we were. Uh, you know, he, I think he may have called us liars, our company, our comedy company, and that we were, I can't even remember, but he denounced us anyway. And, you know, really there's nothing better for a comedian than to be denounced by a child molesting priest from the steps of the Basilica. Uh, so, you know, no matter what, if I think comedians just have to do what they believe in. And then Ricky Gervais says he doesn't care. And like, I think that's nonsense too. He obviously does care. He wouldn't be at it, but, um, but he he just believes, and I think that most of the best people out there believe that th th nobody, if you're kicking up, if you're kicking down, then you should be stopped anyway. And ever, nobody, yeah. you know, but if you're kicking up against the power, then I think you have to just keep on doing that, you know? But in the, in the, in the world that we live in in 2020 with Donald yeah. Trump, who has miraculously being able to say whatever's on his mind has given the rise to say whatever's on your mind. And we still have canceled culture where we're the left is attacking itself. Do you not find that comedians should have the ability to just go out there and edit themselves in a way that they're not going to uh, hurt people's feelings, but also say what's on their mind in a world that we have a Donald Trump as a president. I, you know, I'm hoping well, you're talking to me on Election Day, so I'm very hopeful that Donald Trump won't be president for very much longer. Uh, but um, I I don't know. It hasn't, you know, except for that, it, that 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 example I gave you, it hasn't really touched me. Uh, you know, the the right. I have found that the right has got, got the hate, the big um, conservative hate machine. As soon as you say anything, like they just all swarm on there. And, you know, like I've been called an old, ugly old whore for saying something about, um, about Stephen Harper. I think, okay, ugly old. Yes, maybe, you know, that's, but whore, how do we get to whore from me saying that I disagree with some of Stephen Harper's policies, you know, so that kind of thing was going on, you know, to blame it on the left, to say the left is turning on each other. I think that's nonsense. There is a, okay. you know, the, the, the right wing, the conservatives have, have and, and Donald Trump is the, is the apex is the God of that. 
that, but they've been doing that forever. They've been swarming on and and in, um, you know, taking you down on on, uh, you know, I remember my son was younger when that happened. And uh, and all the women who've been attacked by all those guys who play game, big gamer gate and, uh, you know, women over and by incels and stuff like that. You can't say that's left wing. You know what I mean? So to so, sort of come around to, oh, the left is turning on it. I mean, not, I'm not making fun of you like <laughs> who the left is turning. But, you know, we're we, we are ready to take the blame for everything. This is a worldwide phenomenon that we are also engaged in because we are human beings. And so sometimes people uh, you know, uh, find themselves emotionally overwrought by something that someone else has said, or, uh, you know, um, you know, like Louis CK is a funny, funny guy, but I guess, you know, I guess like, it's like, um, Jeffrey Tubin or whatever his name is, you yeah, know, CNN if commentator. You just, if you can't stop yourself from jerking off while your friend is asleep or while you're on zoom, I think, you know, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, I think, you know, you really got to wonder about those people. You know what I mean? Left, right or center, you know, you really got to think. And then people said that Louis C.K. destroyed all these women's, you know, being a woman in our world is still very, very difficult. Being a woman comedian uh, is not a very happy place to be because you're not exactly welcomed with open arms. Things have become a little easier for female comedians, for sure. Over the last five years, maybe five, 10 years, like they're actually, fe- since Trudeau put in a gender um, equal cabinet, well, the National Film Board has to have 50%, um, you know, female directors, the CBC, all government things now have 50%, which has opened the door for, you know, they're like uh, am- am- amazingly. So, and people are always going, oh, what can we do? We can't be, you know, doing like making a gender equal cabinet. That sort of thing would never work. And it has, but, you know, up and down, I guess. I thought the other day, my father was born in 1898. So, He went, he joined up uh, when he was 16, uh, you know, with 1914 with the First World War. So he went to the First World War, came home when he was 20, uh, just in time for the Spanish flu, which took everybody who was 20, right? Uh, You know, but he didn't. Then uh, the Depression, the Great Depression, led to the Great Depression. Then it went off to the Second World War just to get away from, you know, my mother, I think. Uh, And fought in the Second World War. Not that my mother was... I'm not saying anything bad about my mother. I'm just saying that that's where they were. Uh, went to the Second World War, came home, went through tuberculosis, which just about wiped out Newfoundland altogether, went through polio, never even mentioned one of them, never said a thing. He was the, His favorite story was about how they were rounding the Cape of uh, Good Hope, I guess, or the Horn, and that was one tot per day per man in the British Navy, and the captain hadn't given them their tot, and they all went up, and he gave them a beer bottle full of rum, and they were loaded. They missed the first. That was the only story he ever told. He never talked about the pandemic. He never talked about the war. He never, you know, and so we'll get through it. Obviously, adaptation is what we do. Look at how we've adapted to Trump, to the chaos of Trump. We just don't Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you do that, Jay? Oh, yeah. Opened up Alaska, opened up the, uh, you know, the uh, pristine land in Alaska for oil drilling. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Here we go. You know what I mean? It, well, it, the shock and awe at the first year and a half of his tra- presidency, I think everyone was embarrassed by what was happening. And But, but now, like you say, it's OK. He said this today. Yeah. Sure. But what's yeah. next? What's, mm-hmm. what's he going to say tomorrow to top that? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. the news yeah. media picks it up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, you have had a career that has been ingrained in political satire from Kotoko to this hour is 22 minutes to some of your uh, one woman shows. Where does your political satire come from? Did, was your father and mother both politically active or did they talk about politics? And then that's where you sort of got it from. No, I grew up actually with my Aunt May and my Uncle Jack and my Aunt Fien next door to my parents. But my father was very, he wasn't politically active. He wasn't active at all. But he would, the other story he would tell is wherever, wherever he went in the world, like he'd always say this, he'd always go, when he was drunk, he'd always go, I've been everywhere. Mozambique, fuck it. 
Madagascar, <laughs> fuck it. Like the only place he liked was Newfoundland. And he went, uh, you know, everywhere where you saw Mother England or the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, that's where you saw poverty and disease and misery, right? And he had gone around the world on, oh, he'd started out on the big four masters. And so he was very, you know, he used to go to the English working man, he don't even have a suit of clothes. You know, like he was very, very, and he was a very proud working man. He didn't have that, I'm gonna work my way up from working man. Uh, and, and my brothers are the same way. Like, the, like you know, who put the fucking working uh, uh, boss's cap on him? Nobody wants to be the boss. Everybody wants to be working, right? And doing a an extraordinary job, all of them. But so, but, but being that, I, I don't know why I, do, uh, you know, but it wasn't the time, do you think? Because I was, you know, the summer of love was 67. And, you know, that was, you know, just me in high school. And so we went on strike, you know, we, we did a lot of, uh, you know, we, we, turned over cars in front of the American embassy. We had an American embassy here then uh, at some point about the Vietnam War and stuff like that. So I've always been politically active. I have to admit, uh, you know, reading um, that guy's um, book, Down Among the Thugs, he was talking about uh, uh, football, the footballers in England and, you yeah. know, how it would go mad. I have to admit that there was a thrill in turning over that car in front of the, you know, and to be with a, 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 a crowd, to be like when you were lifted, it was like drinking or drugs. Like it was like you were lifted above yourself, but you were in with this mob, <laughs> which really was what we were. Yeah. <laughs> and and that, ex, that rising excitement and that feeling of being part of something larger, right? I, I'm not saying that that's why I do political, <laughs> but I, I was because just confessing that. I was confessing yeah. that, yeah, yeah. So um, you get into comedy and like you say, uh, women in comedy, it's a hard, it's a hard area to break into, but you were able to do it. How did you, how, how did you break into Canadian comedy? Because there are few women who were able to have the success stories like you have, who have had a career that has spanned from the eighties to 2020. How have you been able to do it? Hmm. Well, you know, I didn't know. I thought I was going to, you know, I thought I was going to be a journalist, you know, yep. but I just um, didn't have the marks to get into journalism school. And then I thought, you know, I was just going to be a failure always. And uh, and then I decided to, I got a job as a researcher for the local um, um, uh, evening news. You know what I mean? I didn't, I remember Robin... Taylor was our thing. And I remember him saying, Mary, coming in at 11 is late, but it's all right. Coming in at 12, a little less, you know, acceptable. But coming in at two, at two, you know, like it was just, I was the worst researcher. Everybody did their own research. There was nothing for me to do. So I thought, why go in, you know? But then I decided to go to theater school. And while I was deciding to go to theater school, these people who I met up with like uh, Bob Joy and Andy Jones and Kathy Jones and Diane Olson and Greg Malone and Tommy Sexton were all moving to Toronto, you know, seeking fame and fortune. And so I kind of, when I was going to theater school, I, I lived with Diane and Tommy and Kathy. And I, we wrote Caught on a Stick, which we, you know, Paul Thompson at Theater Pass Mirai, Tommy and Diane auditioned for him and he said uh you know here's three hundred dollars write your own show so we wrote caught on a stick which I thought well I can't do it because you weren't allowed if you were I was at Ryerson and you weren't allowed to be take part in theater if you were at theater school because you might learn some bad habits so anyway I quit and, and went waitressing and then the waitressing was so bad I was such a bad waitress that I went back to Codnistic and then we decided to do a tour of Newfoundland I mean we decided but anyway what I think why I think I managed to go on is like Andy Jones and and Greg Malone had been working for years on material now I I come from a funny family people are really funny and mean um you know, that's uh, but being funny is like coin of the realm in Newfoundland. You 
if you don't have it, you might as well go out and hang yourself. You may not get fed. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like but who the pe- funny people will get fed. Your mother will feed the person who makes her laugh before she'll feed you. Uh, I was the most unfunny person in my in my family, I have to say. But Greg and Andy were going at it in that kind of way. Like uh, they were writing material like uh, the Newfoundland delegation was a piece that Andy did. And uh, and the taxi, which was in our early one, uh, came about, uh, you know, the phone call came. Hello, Mrs. Uh, Richard Alfred's dead. Oh, yes, it was awful. Fell thousands of feet to his death in a swirling tide below. And then it goes on and on and on. Say anything. Uh I, at the, I believe at the end he said, God damn you, mutter. Is that what he calls you, mutter? Yes, that's what it was then. Sorry to be the Grim Reaper, Mrs. Richard. So Andy had that when we were doing some, you know, and so I kind of was lucky enough to get in with a crowd who were that way inclined. And then we fought. I fought really hard because that's what I knew how to do. Seems to me that that may have been other than just a talent for being for reading and comprehension. I may have had a talent for, you know, greed, you know, whether greed in booze or 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 wanting to do more, you know, like get on stage. So so I think I fought really hard to get on stage, you know, because. And I thought for some reason or other, I don't know, like Kathy and I, after Diane left, um, Kathy and I were very competitive. Kathy Jones and I were very competitive. And it was a very shameful thing as women for us to be competitive. Whereas Andy and Tommy and Bob and 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 Greg were highly competitive. And it was totally out in the open. Nobody said blinked about it. But we had to keep ours on the down low, right? Like we had to pretend, you know, that. And you then we spent along. a lot of time supporting the buys, you know, like... And then, but then I have to say, in all honesty, that I remember Greg Malone gave me this piece that was my favorite thing to do in Codco. It was called uh, Betty Anderson Wins an Oscar. And Betty Anderson was Father Knows Best's daughter. And she wins an Oscar and she's, I'm in the audience. And then, you know, they announce that I'm going to win an Oscar. And then I get up and then I trip and I fall. And I got a little blood ball and I got a tiny bit of blood on my face. And then, you know what I mean? I end up being yeah. beaten. Up. And that was really great. Something Greg, you know, and I'm all in an evening gown and stuff like that. And Greg was going to do that. And he he just gave it just very generously gave it to me. So, you know, I complain uh, about like sometimes, you know, you'd say something in a Codco meeting and you'd say it, and then nobody would laugh. And then one of the boys would say it, and then everybody'd laugh. I was like, you know, like apparently it needs a male voice. You know, there a female voice just won't sell the joke. So there, there's all that. But like I have to say, you know, there was the the generosity of all those people who I went to work with, and how good, you know, because they had been, you know, I don't know why we and propinquity again, right place, right time, you know? And, uh, and so we toured across Canada and, uh, then sometime or other we had a TV show and yeah. So about that, you know, and yeah. yeah. And we had Greg and Tommy, what? You got the TV show, you got the TV show of Codco and it ran for six seasons. It was, it's one of the, few sketch comedy shows that actually make it onto Canadian air at the time, because you have CTV and then you have Codco sketch comedy has never quite done well until recent years. How did you make it work in the Oh my God. SCTV uh, kids in the hall. Sketch comedy is always, I mean, traditionally sketch comedy has really worked like somebody, the French, uh, you know, what, what is the French, uh, what's the French equivalent of the CBC? It's called Radio Canada. Radio Canada came here and interviewed me and Buddy was was uh, speaking, uh, you know, much better English than I can speak French, but he was going, so how did this happen, happen that uh, these people who nobody knew uh, from a place that nobody even ever heard of are suddenly on national TV and was like, so. I was really insulted, like, you know, uh, but I don't know, you know, um, Michael Donovan, who was doing film in in um, 
in Halifax came and asked us if we would do. Now, Tommy and Greg had been on a show called Sexton and Malone. I think they'd done two seasons, the s and comic book. And then the wonderful grand band, which Kathy and I were also part of, but it was more Tommy and Greg. Um, we'd done local and Atlantic CBC. And then in the summer, we'd be on replacement, you know, and I had done a series about a boarding house. I think I was 27. I was playing a woman who was 62. So, you know, I figured getting being in my 60s is a snap because I've been practicing forever. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, you know, there was a lot of us on T there was, and I guess there must have been a thing at that point, you know, the way that, uh, thank God, finally, uh, our national broadcasters are saying we have to hear from our indigenous people. It's been, we've been keeping them out. And I think there must have been a little window where they must have said, maybe we should hear some something from the crowd on the East Coast. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And we happened to be there then. <laughs> so I, I was trying to do research and I couldn't find the answer to this. And hopefully you'll be able to enlighten me. What was the initial reason for canceling Codco? Because I can't seem to find if it was canceled, if it was just if they did not pick it up for another season. Because I, the only thing that I can come close to is the pleasant Irish priest of in conversation. Was that the reason why? Because Andy I think we had left went on for two more seasons after that without Andy. Andy yeah. quit because of pleasant Irish priests. Um, but things, and then they. You know, I mean, I don't know if you know, but if you scratch the surface of any sketch comedy troupe that starts out with when they're young, there is a lot of strum and drang and a lot of heartbreak and a lot of tears and a lot of smashed up pulpits and and garbage cans thrown across the floor and tables overturned. And you know what I mean? I'm yeah. in with this crowd this week and now I'm against, you know, and so it just. Um, it just inevitably came to an end, I think, like that was I. I, I'm not sure if we did one season or two seasons after Andy left, but that was a big blow, you know, when Andy left. But, um, but do you we remember did that on. sketch? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, I remember that sketch really well. Yeah. Pleasant Irish priests. Uh, Kathy and I played two old ladies who were walked by and says hello to them. It was like the glory holes in Dublin. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it was like, you know, we were always being castigated for what we said about the Catholic church. Of course, what we said about the Catholic church didn't come anywhere near the depravity of the Catholic church. What you know, they're actually doing. Near. What? Yeah. 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 Um, after that, you uh, start your own show back in Newfoundland. Uh, this hour is 22 minutes, which becomes a nationwide success. Coast to coast, people then start recognizing you. The four of you on that show in the first few seasons become internationally well nationally known as the four comedians that are going to satire any political situation or any situation that's going to happen in canada right um as the uh one of the the creator of the show how did you how did you come up with this the four was it hard to decide it was only going to be four or was it easy to well, go Andy Kathy was in Greg there first and, but he didn't want to do it okay because I think Andy had, even though Pleasant Irish Priest was the reason, I think that Andy had found that television was not his métier, that he didn't really want to do it because I'd asked him. Then Rick Mercer had just done a show with Gerald Lunds at the National Arts Centre and they toured it across Canada. Charles, somebody must die. It was some some um, pundit, some Canadian pundit who had said mean things about Newfoundland, uh, uh, you know, and so... Uh, Rick had done that very successfully. Kathy was just down the road. Uh, and Toomey had been part of Godgo in our TV things, but he very rarely got on. Or even his sketches very rarely got in because the real truth, because we would have Codco meetings, but Toomey wouldn't be there. And so if things had to go, it would always be, oh, well, we might as well cut that sketch by Toomey because you wouldn't have to face him because he wasn't in the meeting. And so Toomey, who happens to be one of the funniest men in the world, uh, so it was easy. Like I went down the road and asked Kathy and she said, well, I'm not really interested in the news. And I said, well, that's what's going to make it so great because you're going to bring it. I went Greg and uh, not um, um, Gerald and Rick just lived on Freshwater Road just in behind me. I cut up through the yard and asked them. 
I, w- I was really only asking Rick. And then Gerald said, uh, could I be the creative producer? Which, you know, now I think I might have said, no, I want to be the creative producer. But then I had so little faith that it would ever happen that I went, oh, yes, that'll be grand. And uh, <laughs> and then I, I can't remember how I got in touch with Toomey. I probably called him or something because we were all, you know, um, very, we live very close to each other and, and, and we're in each other's pockets in a way. So, um, yeah, so that was how that happened. And Michael Donovan, I went up to Halifax and had lunch with Michael Donovan. And he said, if Anfitsan is looking for that exact show, because I thought, first I thought, let's just do it Friday night at the hall and we'll do the news of the week, you know, and it'll be fun. We'll do a late night show. And then I don't remember why I thought I should take it to Michael Donovan, who had been the producer. So I fl- flew up to Halifax or was going to Halifax for some other reason, had lunch with Michael. He said, Evan Fitzan is actually, you know, looking for a show just like that, which again, propinquity, right? Just happened to yeah. be. And um, we went off to Just for Laughs Festival and um, Canadian Air Force was there. And it was something that I think that Evan Fitzan did. He put two shows on, like basically Air Force and us were not not alike at all, but we were the same basic notion of looking at the news. Kids in the Hall and Codco, again, Evan Fitzan, put both of us on at the same time, two sketch yeah. comedy, you know, right? I don't know what his um, what his thinking was. He's never, he's never shared it with me, but uh, yeah. Were the four, did the four of you mold, meld quite quickly when you started working together, the four of you, or were there potential like, Hey, we're trying to get all four of us to be on the same page here. Was it a little bit hard or was it easy for the four of you to start working together? Well, I think it was easy because, uh, you know, we, we knew that we wanted to satirize news and we also wanted to satirize the we wanted to satirize the news, what happened in the news. But we also wanted to satirize the way that news was presented. And we also wanted to say and we had a foolish idea, not so foolish for like Rick, because he was only young then. But I must have been 40 by then. But I sort of thought we could change things. You know what I mean? That by uh, ambushing politicians, we could say what needed to be said and there you go. Things would change. <laughs> of course, they changed for the much worse. Uh, you know, we went into two terms of uh, of Harper, but um, who never let anybody ambush him. In fact, he had um, Jerry. I forget Jerry's last name, but she worked on the show after I left. But he had her arrested. The RCMP arrested her when she was playing. She was playing. She used to do this person who was like a young, a single woman who was really enamored of all men, including uh, the prime minister. And so when she'd ask questions, they'd always be like, you know, and, and then the RCMP took her out in handcuffs. So, you know, it was so, a different barrel what, of fish. What was the reasoning behind the ambush? You talk about how you wanted things changed, but to, to do that in any political situation has to take balls. So you are going in there and saying, you know what? I'm going to walk up to John Cretchen. I'm going to walk up to Mike Harris because uh, it aired during the Mike Harris years. And I remember my father always yelling in saying, Hey, you need to come watch this because we would record them. And he would show me them because we, there was no YouTube at the time. So you had right. to record everything. So how did that come about? Who was the first ambush that you guys do did? Do you remember? The first ambush that I did was, Oh my gosh. Uh, he's that guy. He, uh, <laughs> the mistake I made first, you know, we knew we were going to ambush people. We knew we were going to come up. That was an idea. I don't know where it came from, but it was, it was, uh, that was what we were going to do. We definitely were going to do. And we each had different names than our own names. And mine was Molly something or other. And I was all dressed up in quite a beautiful suit and had my hair all done. I looked quite good. And, uh, I ambushed a guy Oh, night. No. Politician? No, he wasn't a politician. He writes opinion pieces. Anyway, he was my first one and I was all dressed up and I asked him something and he went blah, 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 blah. And because I was, which is what gets in women's way, I think, because it was all done up like a band box, I couldn't. I didn't know what to do. I was completely frozen into my li- perfect lipstick, eyes, hair, everything, perfect suit. Yeah. You know, and I just, we, we never used it. 
Um, then the next one, I think, was, um, you know, that awful fat fucker. Um, Mike Duffy? <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, you know, uh, Conrad Black. Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. I yes, asked yes. him to give me money. And he said, you know, and he was really mean. And then when it began to work for me is when I started to go as Marg first in my house coat, because Marg always wore her house coat. And because if I'm behind, if I'm me or even some version of me that's better looking than I am, I feel completely frozen. You know what I mean? Whereas if I'm Marg, you know, in a house coat and my slippers and stuff, I feel quite, you know, she's an older woman. She says what she likes, you know, and there you go. And, uh, you know, she's quite friendly. And of course I realized with Marg after a while that Everything I said had to come from a positive place, even though I said some really bad things. But it had to come from that, like, I'm your aunt, and I'm telling you right now, you've got to stop the lying because it's not going to get you anywhere. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, it always had to come from that emotional place of like, I'm trying to help you out. Yeah, you know, yeah. it could never because when you're that close to someone, except for Stephen Harper and uh and Ralph, whatever his name was out in Alberta, you feel their humanity, but their humanity was so buried underneath layers of God knows what that you do couldn't feel. It was like it was like linking into a stick. What was his name, Ralph? Klein. Yeah, Ralph Klein. <laughs> the, the two of them, honestly, you couldn't feel anything off them. But um, Mike Harris, you could. Um, but uh, yeah, so you know, and I, I used to find it so humiliating to be there in that stupid felt costume with the gold glue and uh, and the plastic sword and the bad, bad makeup and everybody else there, you know, from CTV or CBC in their uh, Burberry, uh, you know, uh, trench coats and their leather things uh, that I was so ashamed by the time I'd get to, you know, we'd always wait till the end of the uh, scrum. So yeah. we wouldn't get in anybody's way. And so by the time we get to the end of the scrum, I'd be so ashamed. I'd think, oh, shag it. I might as well just go for it anyway. Like, you know, there's I've got I have no, you know, like uh, nothing left to lose here. I'm, you know, did at, during that time when you were doing these ambushes, did you get buy in from politicians? Because you talked about how Stephen Harper, you you did ambush him once and it was an amazing ambush at that. <laughs> I, I, I still I still see his face so frozen and I don't know what to say to you right now. But but by I this him twice. OK, once I kissed him. Which yep. then everybody went mad about that. I mean, that was, you know, the, the Globe and Mail said, you know, going too far. It was like when I ambushed uh, uh, Ford. Mr. Ford and Mr. Ford lied like a fucking rug and said his children were there. It was like, oh, come on. You know, you're so out of it on crack with. But, but of course, Mr. Poor old Mr. Ford, he was he's he was our Trump, wasn't he? And in a, in a way, you think. Maybe Trump is on Adderall or something, so much Adderall that he can't think anymore and he's got an addiction and he's behaving in this way because he doesn't know what else to do. And in the end, you sort of thought that's what Rob Ford, he was, a, he was, he had a disease, right? He had a disease of addiction. And so that caused him to be, I don't know what, what exactly it caused him to be, but some of the stuff that he was, was a result of that anyway. But yeah, they went mad. And the second, uh, the second one that was nearing the end of my time on this hour is 22 minutes and everybody, uh, you know, um, um, we then, you know, I remember we had a person who was the creative, uh, creative producer then. And he said, we don't want to make the news. We want to, we want to make fun of the news. And I thought, Mm, that's interesting because I thought we wanted to make the news and make fun of the news. Right. You know, yeah. but yeah, but things changed and as but, things have to change over time. Right. No, understandable. But the, the thing that I want to try and get at is you were, you became recognizable. I'm assuming you could not go anywhere with a camera where people in a political setting would go, Oh no, what is she going to do? And then the politician would see you and say, I, I need to do this because it will be look good on my image to do that. Yeah. Did you find that That's too? what definitely happened, except with Mike Harris. They, they he had I had to stand on the toilet in the ladies can. 
hiding out. Oh, it's a very glamorous job. Uh, hiding out from Mike Harris in the second ambush because they, they had sent, they knew I was there. I'd come into Queens Park and, and they knew I was there and they were trying to get us out. Now, the cameraman, we, we would have uh, passes anyway, right? Uh, so the cameraman and the producer would have passes and they would sometimes be there because they were allowed to be there. And I even had a pass, but they just wouldn't, you know, um, and and the, then they, I would just, they one of them would come to the toilet <laughs> and then I would get down off the toilet and come out and just, we'd have to do it right at the end. You know what I mean? So that I could just run in and get them. So, yeah. And then there did happen to be that heartbreaking time when people want it to be on the show, when politicians want it to be on the show. And, and, you know, and then you realize that far from changing things, you're actually, you know, just nailing in the old yeah. you know, thing. Right. So, Yeah. Um, before the end of the, sh the before you, uh, you you left this hour is twenty two minutes in two thousand four. That was your last full time season that you were a series regular, and then you went on to becoming a more guest regular with Marg and a few other uh, uh, sketches that you had. Um, but there's one area in your life that I want to talk about because it may it was a very influential movie in my life. Uh, it helped me get through my uh, coming out as a child, which was Mambo Italiano. Oh yeah. Um, it, 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 I it, it's still top ten movies in my list of movies that I watch. Uh, in 2003, when that came out gay rights was not a big issue. It was not prevalent in the news. It was not being talked about. Yes, same-sex marriage would come three years later in 2006, but you made a decision to do that movie and potentially it could have backlashes because gay rights, yet again, well, there was still that divide. You sound much more, more heroic. Like Tommy <laughs> and Greg had fought, you know, but, you know, uh, Tommy particularly had been, you know, fighting against, uh, you know, the, had had been fighting to take the stigma off AIDS. He had gone on TV and said that he was gay. His mom had even, you know, come out and Mrs. Sexton had very, you know, uh, with, uh, with a heroic mom's heart done that. There didn't seem to me, you know what I mean? It's like interesting to say that, but like we won the Purple Diesel Award in, in Halifax, you know, because our material on Codco was always gay. We had we had Jerome and the Queens counselors. And, you know what I mean? We were always doing gay material. We were cross dressing both ways all the time. So that didn't seem. And plus, on top of that, just to take any hero heroism out of there, the guy who wrote it, uh, whose name escapes me right now, but that had been a major hit all across Montreal. Like they were turning away people, you know, hundreds and thousands of people had loved that play. And so, uh, you know, when uh, Denise, who I didn't know at the time, Denise Robert from Cinemaginaire asked me to do it. I was thrilled to do it. And uh, and then I tried to get an Italian accent, uh, which I some people like there's an Italian lady who's here and she said it was the best Italian accent ever. And then but other people had said it sounded like a Newfoundlander doing an Italian accent. But I guess that she had picked up a bit of Newfoundland, too, with her Italian accent. But anyway, so it was um, it was great, uh, great to do. And I never even thought of that first or last that it was uh, gay material. You know what I mean? Um, oh, I'm just saying because there wasn't that many movies that were directed towards no. the gay community. And this yeah. was one of the first Canadian ones. Now, now you're seeing it a little bit more often, but just from my standpoint, it was those a, it, people like that guy who wrote it, a great guy who's still writing plays and films. I think uh, yeah. he, you know, what he did was really great. And to involve his whole, you know, to be in the midst of an Italian, big Italian family where, you know what I mean? And, um, and, and did, Denise at Cinemaginaire, they were brave. I was just really happy to get in there, you know. Well, I'm, I'm glad you did because, it, like I said, it did make a lot of my life. And my my father and my mother have watched it since, and they say, "Yeah, I was I was Mary Walsh." <laughs> I couldn't believe at the time that my son was gay. So, thank you yeah. for allowing a uh, part of your life and part, telling that story and allowing my parents to come to acceptance of. Oh, good. That's yeah. good, eh? Isn't that yeah. great? It yeah. is. Um, in 2004, though, you did decide to leave as a series regular. This hour is 22 minutes. Was that a big decision in your part? 
or was it just the time for you? I had really, you know, and when I look back on it now, I can see that I had to. I did, there was no other, uh, I had, I, you know, once I used to do this uh, lesbian character who also was very knowledgeable in terms of uh, tech kind of stuff, neither of which, I'm neither lesbian nor tech. And I had to do an enormous amount of reading to come up with her, right? And I did it live and I got a standing ovation and we never got standing ovations. And so I got a standing ovation for this thing that I did. And I didn't think, isn't that fabulous? I thought, oh fuck, now what am I gonna do next week? You know, now I got a standing ovation. So I had come to a kind of end in terms of, uh, and, and then I cut into a place where I didn't have any new characters. I didn't know what else to write. I could, you know, like, uh, I, I don't know. Anyway, I was at a place, yeah, a, 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 a place where it was just time to move on. It wasn't necessarily, like I moved on doing, uh, I did um, Young Trivia's Been Made Away With, a, a, a movie with, again, Denise Robert and Cinema Genere out of Montreal. And I did Hatching, Matching and Dispatching, which I still think is an exquisitely funny piece that, you know, like, it's like that beer, you know, in Nova Scotia, those who like it, like it a lot. <laughs> and uh, and ne neither of those took off in the way that, um, I think actually with Triffy, it is the only movie I think that the crowd of bastards at the Globe and Mail gave no stars to. At least like the worst movie, they gave a half a star, but Triffy got none. Uh, and um, so that was a couple of years of that. You know what I mean? And then not, I came out battered from, Triffy, from doing Triffy. I really wasn't prepared. <laughs> Oh, look at that. Sorry about that. I'll just turn that off. Um, uh, hold on. Um, I really wasn't prepared for that. I didn't know what to do. Hatching, I kept thinking there was going to be more hatching, you know, and there wasn't ever. Uh, we did do the movie last year, a couple of years ago, uh, Fury, a Fury Christmas. Yeah, Christmas 2017. Year. And that was one of the best experiences I ever had with ha the hatching experience. Like we had... Mark McKinney, Sean Majumdar, Joel Thomas Hines, Susan Kent, Sherry Weiss, uh, Adriana Maggs, uh, Rick Boland. Oh my God, it was just like it was a cast from heaven. Henry Sarafoner, who is possibly one of the best uh, comedy directors in the country, though I'd love to say a woman's name, but Henry got a start and many women weren't encouraged to direct comedy and there are not a lot of women in character. Henry is like one of those guys, he covers everything so that when you get in the edit suite, you can make the joke. Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, he just, it's all there. You can actually, cause a joke is a very, you know, dodgy yeah. little piece of business. And if you don't have all the coverage, you can't build the joke, right? You can't, cause it goes like this. I mean, I don't know, you're in, you're out, but I'm bump. I don't know. I, I'm not very technical when it comes to jokes, but I do know how to build one. I mean, I do know that if you don't have enough coverage, you can't build one in the, in the thing. So uh, hatching was one of the best experiences I ever had. I think. And oh, and, and I was writing with Ed McDonald, who, had, who is a famous McDonald from Sydney. And Ed was in it too. He was the guy who said it was a hard old time for mother. Um, it was a hard old go for mother. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, that was, it, it's, you know, I, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And it just didn't go, you know, nobody picked it up. It was just, you know, and that's wrong the name time, wrong game. place, I guess. Again, no propinquity. <laughs> Um, since you've left, you have done numerous guest appearances on numerous Canadian shows. You have been in movies. And one area that I want to talk about is your book, uh, Crying for the Moon, uh, released in 2017. I recommend it to anyone who is listening to pick it up, buy a copy. It's an amazing read. You, in interviews I've uh, researched and I've watched with you, you've said that you always wanted to be a, a novelist because you wanted to be in that club. 
Yeah. Do you, yeah, do yeah. you feel like you're in that club now with that release no, of that the novel? First thing is that they always say anybody can has everybody has one book in them. So now I have to write a second book <laughs> or three or four. And it took me like, you know, 60 years to write the first one. So I'm, you know, I'm on it now. I'm I'm writing a new book. It's called either Come Home Year or How to Be Good or The Little Girl Who Grew Up Next Door to Her Family. I'm not sure, but it's a and, and I'm not going to tell you that I'm not going to tell you any more about it because, of course, it doesn't exi- it, it exists to a certain extent, but I'm working on it now. And from Crying for the Moon, you know, uh, Christina Jennings over at um, uh, at Shaftesbury um, approached me or I approached her. I don't remember. But we're trying to put together something from Crying for the Moon that is sort of like the Dairy Girls, like the character in Crying for the Moon has friends who are, th- they call themselves the three musketeers. And it's like 1967. And it's a very specific time in St. John's. So we're trying to, you know, we're writing, doing some writing on that. So I'm pretty thrilled about that. Um, but that's not what you asked me, is it? No, I just wanted to know. I feel like I'm part of the club. No, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> I've got to do a number. I, I, I'm a slow starter anyway. It's going to take me another four or five books to actually <laughs> get in the club. Well, well, I will be the first in line to buy them all, no oh, matter you. how you put out. Um, uh, my last set of questions is there in 2019, you gave two talks that made me think really hard about my life right now. Uh, you gave one to Idea, Idea City and also to TED Talk as well about aging. And you said you're happier when you're older. You, you're happier now. Uh, older people are happier when they're older compared to what you're hearing in the past of uh, these are the best days of your life. Right. So the question has to be posed to you. Are you happier today than you were when you're 20s and in your 30s? Oh, my God. Are you kidding? Oh, I mean, you know, people say, would you go back? And I go, are you fucking kidding me? Never. Unless you could guarantee me that I would win the Nobel Prize for Literature. If I could get a guarantee for that, I would go back. Other than that, absolutely not. Totally miserable. You know, they've proven there's a U bend towards towards happiness. I feel it, you know, so many people feel it. I remember when I was young, people used to say to me, you know, enjoy yourself now. You know, these are the best years of your life. And I used to think if these are the best years of my life, I'm just going to go hang myself somewhere. But thanks be to God, they were wrong. And really it is, they say that it's true. You know how the adolescence is mostly miserable because of the hormonal changes and all that. But for some people it isn't. So it's not guaranteed that your adolescence is going to be miserable. And it's not guaranteed that your old age is going to be, you know, happy. But for most people, that's the little gift. That's one of life's thousand tendernesses is that you actually are what you've been pursuing all your life. Happiness, supposedly uh, you actually get there. So you've gotten there and you're happy. I am. You know, I still have a lot of, uh, you know, anxiety and uh uh, you know, I still have a lot of character defects, you know, uh, you know, like impatience and things. And, uh, you know, that's what I'm trying to deal with now, impatience. Like yesterday I came in, I was asking my husband for something. I went, is there a bit of paper around and, and a pen? And he went, um, oh, well, here's a pen. And uh, he said, what kind of paper do you want? And I went, the kind of paper that I would write on with this pen. Like I'm asking somebody for a favor and yet I'm turning like a dog on them and speaking to them, you know, in that tone. And uh, so I've got to get rid of that tone. I'd be happier if I didn't have that tone. And, you know, Kathy and Andy's mom used to always say, is he kind? Is he kind? And kindness is so important. And I fall down on that, but that's something that I hope to be, kind and gentle before I finally do the big, you know, do the big um, shuffle off the, this mortal coil. I'd like to get to be, and I think I am getting kinder and more gentle though. Sometimes I shock myself by the viciousness of myself uh, and, the, and then my own um, impatience with people. Like, Come on, what's taking the time. And especially when I'm trying to create, because things are going through my head. I can't get them down fast enough. And the other person certainly can't get them down fast enough. But anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. But I feel 
like, I guess I went, I had a very hopeless kind of youth. You know, I didn't feel there was, it just seemed to be a dark tunnel and you must have gone through that yourself before you, you know what I mean? When, yeah. when, when it wasn't acceptable to come out and stuff like yeah. that. And now I feel, no, I feel like, you know, if there is, if I am in a tunnel, it's a, it's a bright one. There's an interesting echo. You can sing. There's a big light at the other end, you know, and it's not a train. <laughs> so, you know, no, I feel, I do feel much happier and more content. And I have noticed over time that, it, and this is such a twee sort of thing to say, but it isn't the externals because the externals keep coming. And I must say that I have, let them destroy me at times and and really uh you know but i'm more and more as i grow older i see that you know happiness is an internal job and that the externals are just going to things are not going to go people are not going to live up to your expectations you're not going to get the jobs you want you're not going to get the reviews you want in the globe and mail uh but you know like i often felt when i was younger like I often stayed mad with people for 40 years. I often, it wasn't often because I could, didn't have that many years, but you know, not letting things go, not letting things go at all, holding on to them as, and I thought that that was my job. Do you know what I mean? I was raised by wolves, you know what I mean? So, uh, uh, but, but, but knowing a little bit better just because you've been around long enough just makes things so much easier, you know? Has the this this global pandemic taught you how to be more patient because everyone is going by so slow of a measure now? I, I, the global pandemic has really been good to me. You know, I have found that the not like I do a lot of traveling around the country and speechifying and, you know, telling a few jokes and stuff like that. And that's and I haven't been able to do it. So I've been just. I'm always, like I always say, I have no friends except my friends at Air Canada, uh, you know, I spend the most time with. But um, um, but I haven't been able to do that. So it's given me a chance to live as opposed to be. You know what I mean? What do they say that it's not, uh, you know, it's not doing, it's being. And I'm yeah, a big yeah. doer. And in that doing, I tend to forget what might be important. And so the global pandemic has given me a bit of a, you know, dart in the arse about that. And uh, I've been, yeah, pretty happy during the global, isn't that a terrible thing to say? I've been happy during the global pandemic. Isn't that terrible? It but, is, but at the same time, if you're finding light in the dark place, then yes, yeah. it is a great thing to say because I, I, I've been enjoying it too, because, uh, and this is, this is going to sound really bad, but everyone that I asked to do a podcast with, or like to come on the show, they're like, yeah, because I'm thinking, do they not have time? Like, do they not have other things to do right now? But I guess not <laughs> because everyone's not doing much. <laughs> it's true. Sure. There's only so much sourdough bread really that, you know, you want to be making, right? <laughs> True that. Um, Mary, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This thank has you. cheered I up really my. Enjoyed it. Thank you once again for listening to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. If you love this episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast, head over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and subscribe, rate us, and leave us a review. All the links to our social media accounts are in the show notes or visit www.crossborderinterviews.ca. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced and edited by Miranda Brown and Associates Incorporated. Be sure to tune in for our next episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Once again, thank you. Bye-bye.